Hello, everyone. This lesson is going to start off our fourth unit of the course, which will actually lead quite nicely to the fifth unit of the course, because we're going to be talking about the nature of light. And so the first thing that we're going to do is talk about how light is classically considered a wave. And a lot of what we're going to do in this first part is just describe light in terms of, well, first review what waves are and what their properties are, and then describe how light actually behaves like other kinds of waves that you might be familiar with, like water waves or sound waves. But then we're going to see that light also behaves in other waves that, in other ways that don't really uh, follow the way other waves behave. And so if we're going to describe a full, if we're going to have a full description of light, we need to adjust our model of light and build in a quantum mechanical description. So at that point, we're going to start talking about light as a particle. Now, this might seem kind of strange. How can light be a wave and a particle? Um, but in actuality, this is a, a very long-standing debate among physicists. Um, and uh, I'm going to get to that very shortly. But I first want to do a little bit of a review from some things that we covered in grade 11 when we talked about waves. And the first thing is that there is something called the principle of superposition. And this principle of superposition matters when two waves meet each other. So in grade 11, we generally talked about waves traveling on uh, strings or on, on springs, those kinds of things, big slinkies. And so what we were really doing is we were describing is that two waves would meet each other. And although, although there are lots of complicated things that can happen, the simplest case is that the waves would either meet each other and constructively interfere, creating a larger wave, or they could meet each other and destructively interfere, creating no wave or a node, as it's known. So here's a basic diagram showing this uh, for, the, for the first image at the top. The two waves are both upright waves. They're traveling toward each other. Um, so I apologize. So on the on the left side of the diagram uh, is basically what happens in the case of constructive interference. So you have two waves approaching each other. They meet each other in the middle. They form, in this case, a super crest. And then the waves pass through each other as if they had never met. In the second set of images on the right-hand side, the two waves are on opposite sides of the medium. So one is a so in this case, one is a, a crest and the other is a trough. Or you might say that one is a upright wave, the other is an inverse wave. Regardless, they meet each other in the middle. And because the two waves have exactly the same amplitude, exactly the same wavelength, they basically cancel out and create a node. So it almost, so for that moment in time, it appears as though the medium is actually undisturbed. Uh, after that, the waves move through each other as if they were never as if they had never interfered. So let me go back to that kind of question that I that I posed because it's a quite a long-standing question: Is light a wave, or is light a particle? And I'm casting it here as an or question because historically that's how people thought about it: as is light one of these things, or is it the other? And um, Although there are although there are very different there there are many models of, of of light and I don't have time to go through all of the history, one of the most successful models was proposed by Christian Huygens, who is a Dutch scientist, a Dutch, Dutch mathematician, um, and he thought that light was composed of longitudinal waves, just like sound waves are. So Huygens basically noticed certain uh, characteristics of light that led him to think about light as interfering with each other. And interference is really a wave phenomenon, right? Particles don't interfere with each other um, in the same way that waves do. Or, I mean, really, if, if a particle meets a particle, then there's going to be some kind of a collision, right? Uh, some kind of, probably some kind of change in momentum, um, which doesn't happen with waves, right? When waves interfere with each other, with each other they, they interfere, but then they move through each other as if nothing had actually happened. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Sir Isaac Newton, and uh, although he's often remembered for his um, three laws, right, the, the laws of motion, and in optics, Sir Isaac Newton basically published all of his findings and all of his uh, all of all of the material that he had lectured on 
in regards to a study of light. But in the case of Newton, he was studying light as it went through prisms, mostly prisms and lenses and those sorts of things. And so light, and he was also using white light because that's all that they, well, that's in, in, in essence, that's what they had to work with at the time, light from the sun or light from candles, those sorts of things. So because of, um, because of the because of his observations, specifically with regards to refraction, where light bends in in a, in a prism or in or in some kind of a medium, um, as rather as it goes from one medium to another, uh, and also dispersion, which is how light will spread out in a prism. Newton was basically trying to describe the concept the the nature of light using a particle model. Now. Again, this might seem kind of strange, but there are other characteristics of light that do behave the way particles do. For example, light reflects off a surface. So if this were a surface here, if I had light come in, if it were a reflective surface, the light would bounce off. And that's actually a lot like how a billiard ball reflects off, um, say, the side of a pool table. Um, so, it's not, so it's not completely crazy to think of light as a particle. Uh, Newton didn't call them particles per se, he called them corpuscles, which was basically, but it's the same kind of idea. And so these, little, so these light particles would have different properties, and those different properties would influence, for example, the color of, uh, of the light. Okay, so let's go back to the evidence, because although, um, although Huygens proposed the model, uh, it, the, the evidence for interference came much later. So a couple things started to be observed, and these, these observations were very difficult to describe using a particle model. One was the concept of diffraction. Now, you may have seen this before, but if you ever, if you ever shine, uh, laser light is the best for this, but only because it's, it's uh, very highly collimated. But if you, if, but if you shine even uh, just like a, a flashlight or something, at um, at a hole, um, you may actually see the light diffract or bend around the corner. So again, the best way of observing this is if you shine uh, a light at a small slit or a small opening, some kind of some kind of um, uh, small opening, you'll basically see an image far away that will appear blurry. So this is an image of. Um, someone shining what's probably a laser light, although I'm not entirely sure, through a, uh, a straight razor blade. And uh, so what you can see here is that is this, this, is, this is the image as it appears on the screen, and you can see that the, the edges of the razor blade are kind of, well, they are, they are blurry, right? And if you look really closely, you'll actually see an outline around the edge of the razor blade. Okay, and that isn't a photographic uh, artifact. That's that's actually what you would see with your eye. So um, this kind of observation is really difficult to describe with waves as particles, because after all, if the part, if the light particles were ha were going towards the, were going towards the, in this case, the the razor blade, then you would expect that they would either hit the razor blade and stop, or they would miss the razor blade and keep on going. So really, there shouldn't be any kind of like outline around it, that, that wouldn't make any sense because that would mean that, well, I don't know, somehow the, a particle is, is, is deflecting off of, the, off of the edge of the razor blade. Um, it doesn't really seem to make sense, at least not in the way we understand particles, large macro particles. More observations followed. And these are more specific to interference, right? The kind of thing that Huygens was talking about in his model. Um, so we, so I've already mentioned how water waves interfere with each other, and um, uh, and if and if you don't believe me, if you you know ever, well, we'll do a simulation of it in in just a bit. Um, so basically, uh, Thomas Young was a, was a was a scientist who basically took a light source, I believe he used a candle, and he shone it through two very small slits. 
Now this turned out to be really important because if you're going to get interference, it's really important that you're that you number one, you have to have two sources. That's that's extremely important. And if you're going to observe the interference properly, the two sources have to be in phase, which is a fancy way of saying the waves, the 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 crests and the troughs of the waves have to be happening at the same time. Now for water waves, you can actually experience, you can actually see some of this even if they're not perfectly in phase with each other. But in the case of light, uh, things get a little bit things get a little bit more demanding. So what he did is 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 Young took a his light source, which I think it was a candle, and he put it through two slits. So he basically turned one light source into two because the light wave because the the, the light waves were going through those two slits, and now he had two sources close together that are in phase. So in other words, the crests and troughs of each source are going to happen at the same time. And what he observed was that past the slits on the screen, there were uh, there were many slits, sort of like this. Okay, so again, uh, in, the, in this uh, diagram here, we're using monochromatic light. In other words, we're assuming that we're using a laser only because of convenience. We pass that through two slits, and those two slits basically turn our monochromatic light source into two uh, spherical wave fronts. The exact same thing as, or at least the model that we're using here, is it's the exact same thing as if you had two stones dropped into, or two droplets, I suppose, dropped into a, a, a body of water at the same time. So that's the same kind of concept that we're using here. And again, uh, I'm going to do a simulation to, show, to, to basically show you how this works. But the bottom line is that on the viewing screen far away, we don't just have two slits, which is what you might expect if we, were, if, if we saw uh, light as a particle. But in fact, we see many slits. And again, this doesn't really make sense, right? Again, how are, how are these light particles, how would light particles be bending and and not just traveling through the slit straight. Again, everything I understand about uh, particles traveling through a slit means that the particle should either go straight through it or it should hit the side and not grow, go through at all. So this idea that I end up with in the diagram here, um, six slits instead of the two that I started with doesn't seem to make any sense as long as we consider light as a particle. So, so because of this, the particle model of light, the one proposed by Newton or popularized by Newton, really started to fall um, under question. And so Huygens' earlier model, which you know didn't really have the same kind of backing because Huygens wasn't as well, he wasn't as famous as Newton really, um, started to to gain more traction. So if you're going to look at uh, light and try and describe it as a wave, it's often a good idea to look at other kinds of waves that we understand, right? To use physics that we already understand and perhaps by analogy, use that physics that we already understand to explain new ideas or new, new situations. So I'm gonna show you a simulation and I'm also going to link to it in your work for this week, but essentially it looks at three different wave systems, water, sound, and light. And your job, at least part of your work for this week, will be to see how are the three similar? How are the three systems similar? And how, if at all, are they different? Okay, so that's gonna be part of your work for this week. This simulation is on the FET website, which we've used several times before. And this is going to go, th there, there's actually four different simulations here. Uh, a basic one on how waves uh, are going to look in, throughout the rest of the simulation. So this is really just getting you comfortable with the simulation, getting you comfortable with the interface, making some basic observations. The second one is uh, an interference simulation. I'm not sure that we're gonna spend too much time with this. Well, perhaps, perhaps as a stepping stone to the slits. This this is the, the slit. Um, uh, the slit example is actually the more important one for us because this is a description of Young's two-slit experiment. And then the last one is a diffraction lab or diffraction simulation where you're going to see what happens when we use different colors of light with different sized objects 
and how do those appear on a screen some distance far away? Okay. Um, mathematically, the only one that we spend a lot of time describing is the slit one, right? So uh, in the in the notes for this, there is going to be Young's um, equation for describing where those bright lines should appear on the screen because there is actually a really interesting mathematical relationship there, and it's actually quite straightforward. Um, but I want to I want to um, I want to emphasize that a lot of the math regarding interference and diffraction is actually related, but you don't tend to see that relationship clearly until, well, in my case, it wasn't until uh, second uh, second year university. So that's that's kind of when things kind of line up again in terms of the math, the mathematical description and the physical description. Right now, we're going to spend a lot of time, a lot more time, just looking at the phenomena uh, and playing around with this and seeing what kinds of observations we can make. Not worrying so much about the math. So um, if I can just go into this one briefly, the idea here is most of these simulations work in a similar way. Um, in this simulation, we uh, okay, so the the idea is that we have an option of three different systems. We can use a water faucet, which we can turn on and off, okay? And so in that case, one droplet fell into this pool of water, which we're looking down on from above. Um, we can also have a loudspeaker, which we can turn on and off. So in this case, we're looking at the pressure wave. Um, or we can have a light source. Now, in this case, it's a laser, but they're representing it as um, as a spherical wave, which, OK, fair enough. Um, that's a little weird, <laughs> only because I normally think of lasers as being very, very tightly collimated. But you know what? Maybe it's, just, maybe it's an LED. Sure, let's go with that. Who knows? Sure. So this one basically, you're all, you you press the button and you get one droplet, whereas for this one you get a stream of droplets uh, as long as the faucet is open. Got it. Okay. And the other ones follow the same way. And some of the things you can adjust, of course, you can adjust the frequency. You can increase how quickly the droplets are going to come out. Okay. And see what that does to the to the wave front to the wave pattern that you see. You can adjust the amplitude. So for example, it's already pretty high, but you can max it out uh, to clearly see the bands. Uh, it'll basically just colorize it so that you've got the bands more clearly seen. And if you want to, you can turn this, uh, you can turn this into a graph uh, just so that you basically see the cross section. So this is a little bit more like what we're used to seeing from grade 11. You're just looking at the cross section of the wave or from math class for that matter. So you're basically taking this what is essentially um, a two-dimensional image with a third dimension for the for the height into um, a two-dimensional image. But we're just looking at the cross section along this dotted line, for example, right along this center line. So that's kind of the deal with the simulation. And if I change it to, let's say, the light, it's the same kind of idea. In this case, we're looking at the electric field. Hmm, interesting. Um, so again, I can turn this on. OK, and I can adjust things like the frequency or the color in this case. Go from green to blue. What does that do? Or back to red. What does that do? Anyway, different kinds of things that, anyhow, um, the other thing you could do is you could look at this on a screen. So from this. LED, and I assume this must be an LED. It doesn't, it's not behaving like a laser at all. Um, this is a screen far away, and so what does that actually look like uh, on a screen far away? Okay, so it's just red. Uh, then I'm going to ask you to look at the interference um, simulation, and again, we have the same three, uh, the same three systems, physical systems, the water, sound, and light. Uh, and then you're going to look at that pattern. And then for the slits, same kind of idea. We have, again, water, sound, or light. And this is a little bit weird. 
but again, it follows the same way. In this case, the, <laughs> the light is not being represented as a spherical wave, but instead as a plane wave. This is uh, one. This is uh, one approximation that's frequently made, only because when you have a plane wave reaching a slit, you can see that this plane wave turns into these spherical waves. So this is one way to go from uh, a plane wave. So this, so this would be more appropriate to describe, for example, a laser. A laser is is one way of producing. It's it's often considered that plane waves come out of a out of a laser. But then when those uh, reach uh, a slit of the appropriate size, they get turned into spherical waves. <clears throat> um, anyway, that's a bit of a, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, we can also adjust the number of slits. We can have one slit, we can have two slits, we can have no slits. Um, so in that case, that's not especially interesting. We just have plane waves that go forever. Um, so this is so this slit uh, simulation is where most of what we're going to be most of what you're going to be looking at uh, will happen. However, in the case of diffraction, this is actually kind of fun. This one is only um, used with light, uh, which is not to say that it doesn't happen with sound or water waves, but um, it's you know it's really nicely observable here. So again, you have your light source, you have basically um, kind of a filter in a sense that you can adjust the, the shape on it and see what that produces on the screen. And again, you can adjust different sizes, like what is the size of this uh, hole in this case? Um, eccentricity basically just changes uh, from this from a circle into an ellipse. Anyway, a lot of different things to play around here. Um, again, this one is more just for observation. It's the 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 interference simulation and the slit simulation are where most of your time, I think, is going to be spent. But by all means, play around with the uh, with the diffraction simulation because it's pretty cool. This one in particular, this one is my favorite because this one, without going too deeply into it, this one is similar to what happens when you shine. Or this pattern, I should I should say again. This this pattern here is what you see on the screen. Okay, so this pattern is very similar to what one sees if you shine an X-ray at um, at a crystal. So one of the things that I studied in university that I really enjoyed was something called X-ray um, X-ray crystallography. Sorry, and the idea is that you shine X-rays at a crystal. So in this case, th this would be the crystal, right, with the atoms arranged like this. Um, anyway, but that, but you still see this kind of pattern. You still see this uh, pattern, and depending on what they're, where the dots are located, that actually tells you about the crystal structure. Anyway, that's uh, that's a little bit of an aside, um, but it was uh, it was a pretty cool course, and what I understood about it helped me later on when we were describing in my in my uh, optics course when we were describing things like. Okay, so that's basically it for the simulation. Uh, I hope that the rest of it makes sense. Um, and uh, I hope that I hope that you can answer the questions that I pose on the Google Classroom. Okay, thanks very much, folks. I'll see you in the next video.